Thank you first for ha having me here today. Um, so this talk, um, I, I prepared it for uh, recently for MongoDB Europe. Uh, so we get like a lot of interest in uh, using MongoDB in microservices architectures. Um, since I joined MongoDB, I've been interested in MongoDB containers and, and all that. Uh, so this is a bit of a different flavor with how to do uh, microservices, highly available microservices with MongoDB on, on Kubernetes. Uh, so first, as, um, my name is uh, Marco Bonetti. I'm in the technical services team in, in MongoDB. And basically, we work with uh, customers to ensure that uh, you know, uh, they can make the best of, of their solution using MongoDB, uh, make sure in terms of uh, replication, performance, uh, sharding, that you know, they can achieve what they want uh, when using uh, MongoDB. I'm based in, in, in Ireland. Um, and my main experience is in uh, databases, distributed systems, uh, replication, uh, high availability, and a little bit on, on containers as well. Just to get a sense of, of uh, your experience with uh, containers, Kubernetes, MongoDB, uh, how many of you have used uh, containers? OK, a good few. And uh, how many of you have used or are currently using uh, Kubernetes? OK, <laughs> that's good. And uh, how many of you have uh, used you know, play to play with uh, MongoDB? OK, so there is a good mix <laughs> there. Um, so probably um, you are familiar with, um, with microservices and microservices architectures. You are familiar with the 12-factor app. Uh, the 12-factor app is like a, a manifesto um, for uh, microservice architectures in terms of the elements that a microservice uh, architecture should have. Uh, and one of the main elements there is the, um, uh, the, the backing store. So if we are doing microservices, we need to save our data uh, somewhere. And, and that place, it's uh, the backing services. And that's usually a, a database. And from our experience, what we see is that you know, MongoDB is quite uh, popular in, in those type of uh, architectures. And we see more you know, uh, users interested in uh, using MongoDB in a microservice uh, architecture. So if we are thinking of building a microservice architecture, microservice application with MongoDB, we need to make sure that you know, we care about our data and we need to make sure that you know, it's our application will be highly available and we won't uh, lose, um, lose our data and things like that. Uh, so we'll see a few things uh, on how we can achieve this. So probably you are all familiar with you know, some of the problems when dealing with uh, containers. Uh, and you know it's a really cool technology. Uh, you know Docker has been around for some time. It helps a lot developers and, and DevOps, you know, to to speed up the, the things that we do. But there are some things that you know we we have to be careful about. And probably you have also seen like some articles some time ago about Docker and how things can go wrong when you use Docker and things like that. So there are some. Um, elements that we need to be aware of if we are using containers, if we are doing a microservices architecture with, with containers. So these elements are mainly things like uh, capacity, uh, affinity, isolation. So if we are running, for example, something like MongoDB in, in, in containers, we need to make sure that we consider also some, uh, something as important as, as the isolation of the, of the processes. Uh, we need to take care about the state, uh, the scalability, uh, how we connect to the, to the database when running on microservices. So the question is how we can manage all this so that we can be successful when doing uh, microservices uh, applications and make sure that you know, they, they will be highly available and, and, and they will perform as, as we expect. So this is what uh, we are going to, to see in this talk. First, we will run like a simple microservice application uh, running on, on MongoDB as the database. Uh, we'll see what um, Kubernetes stateful set are and how we can use them for, for our MongoDB deployment. Uh, we'll see some uh, recommendations uh, for a production-like configuration using a Google Container Engine. And then uh, we will see um, more considerations in terms of high, uh, high availability. So how uh, not only from the database point of view, but also from the application point of view, we can make our application highly available and resilient to possible issues. So the first step is, OK, we're going to implement our microservice application with MongoDB. 
the, there are different options and this um, from our experience with, with customers sometimes it depends on their level of, of expertise with, with these technologies. So the first option is the more traditional approach you know we deploy local servers or we deploy on AWS we can use things like um, we have a cloud manager to uh, integrate with AWS uh, and have monitoring things like that so we can you know do it the traditional way install MongoDB manually all that what we see recently is that um, some customers that are doing already uh, microservices on on the clouds on Azure uh, AWS or Google Container Engine uh, maybe they care more about running my application on the cloud for the database I don't care that much so we see that uh, there is a trend there in terms of um, using uh, MongoDB Atlas that it's our database as a service that it's on the, on the three main clouds so you know for people that are not that interested in the database they can just use it and you know you just connect and, and that's it and uh, we take care of the of the high availability the, the infrastructure and, and so on but at the end of the day we want to have fun doing what we do right so you know there might be people that say okay let's let's go the, the harder approach let's build this ourselves we are already using Kubernetes you know we want to have our MongoDB deployment on Kubernetes as well so this is what we are going to to see today so you know most of us here know how to use containers we just deploy our application we know how to make it uh, to how to put our application in a, in a container so you know we just need the application MongoDB and this should be easy right so let's try this you have the, the URL there for the for the first demo so let's try this so I have everything uh, already uh, configured uh, just to save some time so what I have here um, it's mainly a, a demo application here and um, I have uh, just like a, a simple um, a single MongoD process running in a, in a container right um, we'll see later on what the, the other elements are so for this demo um, I have my, my demo application, it's something simple, right? Just like a, a list of uh, top Italian foods. So, any suggestion? Pizza. Okay, <laughs> that was easy. So what this is doing is it's inserting uh, these elements into the database. Um, so, any, any others? Okay, pasta. Mozzarella. Sorry? Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Um, sorry? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So, how many we have? Mm, okay, we have six. So, okay. Let's just remove so <laughs> we, we keep it to, to this right so this is great you know we have our application we have our data save our top Italian food saving the database so of course you know nothing should happen but um, <coughs> let's say that you know just by chance something happens and uh, the pod where we have the, the application gets deleted so what do you think that will happen with kubernetes yeah so you can see that it restarts the the, the, the pod for the um, for the mongod process um, ah, okay it's it's running again so i'm going to check my application right okay it's kind of thinking So where is our data now? Yeah. <laughs> so our data it's now gone. 
because we were using just you know a single uh, MongoD process, but also because the data was just persisted inside the container. So when the container was deleted, the, the pod was deleted, our data is gone. So this is something that you know <laughs> we need to make sure that we understand uh, if we are dealing with a database in in containers and, and in microservices. Because at, at the end, I guess that most of us here care about our data <laughs> and where we put it and, and how it can be persistent. So, so there should be a better way of doing this, right? Uh, so, what about having like a framework to simply have to simplify how we how we do this, Th so that we can you know deploy and and manage everywhere, regardless if it's in my laptop, uh, on the cloud, or any different cloud, so that we can manage stateful and stateless applications. We can just abstract from from the machines and the resources for each the machine or things like storage. Um, that it's something you know with the, that it's easy to easy to use, easy to to scale, easy to deploy. And of course, if it's something that it's open source and you know, I think most of us when we have a, have an issue, the first thing, okay, Google, tell me what the error is. So if we are using something that it's open source with a great community, it's even better. So we are going to see how we can integrate uh, something like uh, Kubernetes with, with MongoDB. So I think only a few of you were familiar with Kubernetes. So we are going to go through just like uh, a brief Kubernetes 101, what are the main elements so that we can understand what uh, comes after. So we have um, the, the Kubernetes cluster. The idea is that we have a cluster and th there is one element that is called the master that coordinates uh, the different um, uh, compute nodes that are uh, building the, the cluster. Uh, the applications are um, decoupled from the individual host, so we deploy our application, we don't care on which host the application will be running on. Uh, and the idea is that we have uh, two main elements, uh, the master that uh, is in charge of scheduling the application, scheduling the containers in the available nodes. Uh, it will maintain the state, uh, it will be responsible of tracking the resources and um, things like uh, if we want to, to scale our deployment. And then we have the, the compute nodes that are just like the work machines uh, that are running like um, an agent that connects with the API to the, to the master. And then it's running just the, um, the Docker uh, in most of the cases as the, as the container runtime. So a critical element when we are using something like, like Kubernetes or like Docker Swarm, uh, it's uh, the flexibility that we have in um, uh, scheduling uh, where we deploy each application or where we deploy each, each pod or each container. So this is something that you know, it's the master is responsible for. It will track all the pods, all the resources that are available in the nodes, which node is uh, the best suited for, for this pod. And we can even define things like uh, constraints or affinity rules. And we'll see later on how this is really cool for our use case here in terms of high availability. So we have um, the options like um, a node selector, for example. So we can define just like a key value environment test, things like that, that then the master can use when scheduling the, the container. Then the nodes have a uh, default uh, label from Kubernetes, so we can define rules based on the host name, the operating system. We can define rules, for example, in terms of uh, the instance type. So if we have an insta a large instance, you know, probably we don't want to use it for, for testing, things like that. And what it's really cool is uh, the affinity rule. So we can define um, rules in terms of uh, node affinity. So this is in terms of the, you know, the servers or the instances where we run our containers, but we can also define rules of affinity and anti-affinity based on the pods that are running uh, on the different nodes. So we can check which pods are running on, on a given node and based on that establish some kind of rules. And we'll see an, an example later on. So as you probably guess, the nodes are responsible of just providing capacity, uh, CPU and memory so that we can run our pods. And then the pods uh, are a set of one or more containers, uh, plus um, the storage volumes uh, and other elements like the IP address, uh, the image that we are using, the port. Uh, and this is like the, the, this um, set of, of elements is what we call a pod. In the example here, I'm using just a single container uh, per pod. 
So then we have containers, and uh, probably you know we all here know what it's a container, what it means, how it works. Um, but at the end of the day, it's like a unit of, of packaging. Um, and one definition that I um, that I read and I quite like a lot is that at the end, containers uh, are just like uh, the combination of two main uh, Linux kernel features, namespaces and C groups. So with namespaces, we can define what a process can see. And with C groups, we can define what a process uh, can use. Uh, so the idea is that this, um, with this combination, we can use containers. And in our example here, uh, we'll have um, one pod. Each pod will have a single container. And the container will be running the MongoD process with the usual uh, default options. Uh, on top of that, we have in Kubernetes what it's called services. Uh, and services are like a logical set of uh, pods and the rule or the policy by which we can access them. Uh, so the idea is that we need to define a service uh, to, to define how our application uh, or can receive traffic. Uh, so in the example there, you can see that there are like the, the two groups, um, and we can define like the services uh, for, for each type of, of application, for example. Uh, so now we got some ideas of how Kubernetes works. Um, now we are going to see what is a stateful set. And stateful set is something uh, introduced recently in Kubernetes, and it aims to help with the cases of stateful application. So this was called previously pet set, um, but the, the use case of stateful application is quite important for um, for Kubernetes, and and this this is like of great help for applications like MongoDB or databases or stateful applications where we need to do something different than you know, a web application, for example. Uh, so the idea is that it's designed for um, an application that require, require a unique network identifiers. Um, we need stable persistent storage, otherwise we lose our data, <laughs> as we said before. Uh, and we also need um, order and graceful um, termination, deployment, uh, and scaling. And we'll see how this um, is important uh, compared to the default behavior in Kubernetes when all the pods are running in parallel at the same time. So to create our MongoDB stateful set, uh, we just need to define the persistent volume claims. We'll see in a bit what, what that means. We have a headlet service that is a special type of service um, that in this case we don't need any load balancing. So, so that's uh, why we need this uh, headlet service, and then the definition of the of the stateful set. So, um, as I said, the the stateful set, uh, the idea is that we'll have a, a unique identity to the pods, uh, and they will have a, an ordinal in the in the or in their name. Uh, and the the cool thing is that the identity is uh, staying with the with the pods, so it doesn't matter what the pods is scheduled, it will always have that uh, identity. Um, and the host name, uh, for example, will be based on the stateful set name and then an ordinal. Um, and this, combined to the fact that the pods are created, scale, and deleted sequentially, means that we, we know for sure that if we are deploying a stateful set and the stateful set is called Mongo, we know for sure that the first pod to be deployed will be Mongo-0. The next one will be Mongo-1, and the second one will be Mongo-2. So this is quite cool if we do, if we want to then implement some logic, for example, to detect when the three pods are up and running, and maybe run a script to configure the replica set. For headless services, uh, there are like um, different type of services in, in Kubernetes. We have a uh, node port, we have uh, load balancing. So it depends on the use case. Uh, but for example, for something like a database or even a, um, a replica set in MongoDB where we have primary and two secondaries, uh, for example, it doesn't make sense to, to be load balancing. Uh, so in this case, um, we just need the headlet service. Uh, and this, this service, in particular, it's the, the, the one we need for stateful set. So, so basically, the, the definition is sta of sa stateful set is based on uh, persistent storage, the headlet service, and the actual stateful set definition. And this combined to the, um, to the internal DNS server in Kubernetes means that when we use this combination, um, we'll have a unique uh, DNS address to access all the pods. Uh, and the template for the DNS name will be podname.service. 
Uh, and we know again for sure that that will be the template that will be used. So as you can see, it's quite cool if we have Mongo zero and we want to uh, initiate the replica set, we need to specify whether it's the, the IP address or the host name. And in this case, because it's all running in Kubernetes and we have the DNS server in Kubernetes and all the pods are registered with this type of host name, it's quite easy to just go do RS initiate and then just add Mongo one, Mongo two, that's it, it's configured. So you can see that compared to other um, configurations where we, we are using, um, for example, normal Docker, uh, this, is, this is quite useful and, and simplifies you know, the, the setup of the, of the environment. In terms of uh, persistent storage volume, so this is a critical component for, for stateful sets, of course, because we need to make sure that we can have um, uh, persistency for, for our data. And in terms of uh, the provisioning of the volume, there are two types. It can be uh, static or uh, dynamic. So if it's static, we will have to uh, create the volume uh, manually, whether it's on AWS or on the cloud provider. Um, so it will be to create the, the persistent volume and then uh, create the persistent volume claim as well. But when we are using um, cloud providers like uh, AWS, Azure or, or, or Google Cloud, uh, this is even easier because uh, we can use the dynamic provisioning uh, and that means that just by defining the, um, the provisioner that it's already included in Kubernetes, that will manage to create the volume then in the, in the corresponding um, cloud infrastructure. Uh, so we will have in the end something like this, we'll have the physical storage, uh, persistent volumes then that are mapped to persistent volume claims and then uh, the pods will see the, the persistent volume claim just as a, as a volume. And the cool thing about this is that the persistent volumes uh, are bound uh, to the pod. So what this means? This means that uh, let's say that we have our pod Mongo zero, it's running on node one. If node one something happens and crashes, Kubernetes will try to reschedule uh, pod zero to one of the other nodes available in our Kubernetes cluster. And because we had a persistent volume bound to, to pod zero, the, the persistent volume, and you can think of them as EBS volumes in AWS, the volume will be uh, mounted on the node where pod zero is running. So this means that the pod will start there, it will have our data and everything will be fine. So just to recap and see a, a diagram of the architecture that we have here. Uh, we have the, the, the SSD volume, the persistent volume claim. Uh, this is then accessed by the, this is like a, a single pod and inside we have a single uh, container. We have Mongo zero, Mongo one and Mongo two. We have the headless service. So that means that it will add the dot Mongo uh, to each of the host name in terms of uh, DNS name. And then our application can connect using the, the headless service. So, just to, to summarize what we have seen so far. Stateful set provide a unique pod identity, so it's actually easier to, to manage and to configure things. We have a stateful or predictive network, so we know the host names, we know that they will, the pods will be created in order, so we can define some, some logic based on this. We have st stable or persistent storage, uh, so the, stor the storage and the data for each pod will be persistent uh, to the, the pod being rescheduled to a different node. And then we can also scale a stateful set. So a property of the state, stateful set is that we define the number of replicas, and this is the number of pods that uh, are part of the, of the stateful set, but we can also do something like a scale. And we will increase the number of, um, of pods in the stateful set, and we could, for example, with MongoDB, we could use that to increase the number of secondaries to perform queries on the, on the secondaries. This seems that you know, it can be interesting for, for our use case uh, in terms of high availability. We see that there are like affinity rules. Um, so if we are thinking of going into something more like in, in production, we need to be aware of, of what it means. <laughs> uh, and when we are thinking about the database, uh, you know, the default with MongoDB is to def um, deploy our, our replica set. So for those of you that don't know the concept is like, okay, you have um, a replicated copy of the of the database. Uh, so you'll have, for example, a primary and two secondaries. That's the kind of the default configuration. 
Uh, so in that sense, of course, we need to have three pods. Uh, so each pod is running the container with the MongoD process. But we also need to make sure that each of the pods will be running into a different node. Because if we are running three pods, but all the three pods are in a single node, and that node crashes, you know, our environment and our, our, our high availability will be gone. So we need to make sure that we only deploy a single pod per node. And how can we do that? Well, we mentioned the, the affinity rules uh, earlier on. So this is an example of a, of a, a Kubernetes cluster on, on Google Container Engine. We have uh, three nodes, uh, we have three pods, and what we want to achieve is that each pod will be deployed. So we will deploy only one pod for the replica set RS0 on a, on a given node. So how can we do that? By using this uh, the affinity rule here, we can define an anti-affinity rule and just by using the key values replica set and RS0, uh, we can avoid uh, deploying more than one uh, pod uh, for the replica set with the tag replica set zero on the on the same node. So with this, we achieve not only the the high availability at the at the pod level, but also at the node level. So if we lose one of the nodes, we will still have two nodes. We'll have two pods, and everything will be. Uh, available, our application will be still uh, accessing the, the database. And you can see an example here, uh, and with the with the wide option, you can see how we have uh, three three pods. It's uh, all of them are running. They have different IPs. But then on the right, you can see that uh, the node on which they are they are running, it's different. So this means that if we lose one of the nodes, you know everything will be will be fine for our application. So another cool feature uh, of uh, containers and that we can also implement with, with Kubernetes is uh, in terms of um, compute resources for the containers. So in Kubernetes, we can define uh, requests and limits. The requests are um, how much um, a pod would like to get. Uh, and this is considered when, when the master is doing the scheduling. And then we also have um, limits. That is the most that um, uh, the, the, the container uh, can get. And if we are deploying like multiple uh, pods, multiple containers into, into a single node, this is something really important to understand, and especially for something like a database. Uh, because otherwise, you can have all the pods, all the containers that you want in, into a single node, but then you will start to see you know, resource contention, CPU, memory. Uh, so you don't want to be in that position, and it's better to understand the, the resource consumption for your application and then size the environment accordingly. Um, and in terms of the scheduler, uh, as I said, um, it will ensure that all the resources that are requested for the different pods are actually available in the nodes. And if some of the, re uh, um, the requests resources are not available, the pod won't be scheduled. So going a little bit uh, deeper in terms of um, persistent volumes, uh, there are uh, some uh, specific details that are relevant uh, to our use case here. So we have things like, uh, and this is uh, just at the, um, at the Kubernetes level, we have things like the, um, the access mode. So we can define the access mode for the, for the persistent uh, volumes. Uh, we can define the storage class, and we have different parameters for example, provisioner is when we define the provisioner for the cloud provider that we are using. So if we are using AWS, it would be AWS provisioner uh, to use the dynamic provisioner. Uh, and we have then a reclaim policy. And this is quite interesting uh, because um, this means uh, what will happen with the persistent volume. Uh, for example, if the pod is deleted, is the stateful set is deleted, uh, so we can define different options. We can define uh, retain, we can define uh, recycle, um, and we can define release. So if we define a re a recycle, it will just perform uh, just like an rm dash rf. It will clean up everything. If we define retain, this means that if we think of the persistent volume as the EBS volume in AWS, this means that the volume won't be deleted or anything. So even if the stateful set is deleted, we will be able to access uh, the volume later on, and we will be able to perhaps create another stateful set reusing that, that volume. 
uh, and release means just um, making sure that it's uh, the volume is released and, and deleted uh, by the by the cloud provider. Another important point here um, it's uh, in terms of the um, persistent volume and persistent volume claims and how we map them together. Uh, and this is based on, um, on an interaction with the um, with that with the customer when they were trying to okay if we drop the um, if we drop the persistent volume or we drop the um, the stateful set how can we access back all the the data and th it's important to have like that mapping or the template name the stateful set name and and all that to be able to kind of remount again the data and, and access it in terms of the resiliency for the pods uh, these are also some some of the kind of deeper issues that I've seen uh, with this use case. Uh, and this is more um, likely to happen, uh, at least from what I've seen in, in Google Container Engine. So let's say uh, that we are using on Google uh, Container Engine, the pod is deleted. What will happen there is that uh, the pod will be restarted with a new IP address. Uh, and sometimes what it happens is that uh, the MongoDB process will be started uh, before the um, the DNS entry for the new DNS entry has been um, inserted on the DNS. So if that it's it's more like a race condition, it, it doesn't happen all the time. But when that happens, the MongoDB process it's um, it's not reachable, for example, in terms of the replica set configuration, because when it started, it couldn't reach uh, its own hostname. Uh, so a workaround for that is to use um, something like annotations. Uh, and also defined uh, the concept of init containers that we can use in Kubernetes. So we can uh, define just like a, you know, a simple command. So we'll do like a sleep five and then uh, an init container will start before the actual container um, in our pod. And this means that we will sleep for five seconds and then make sure that we can uh, ping our own host name. Um, and only when that happens, the init containers will uh, return successfully and only at that point the MongoD uh, container will be started for our stateful set. Uh, so with this workaround we can get um, to, to resolve the issue when, when we have a new IP. Otherwise at the MongoDB level what we can do is just perform a, um, a reconfiguration of the replica set. Uh, and in terms of, um, this is all in terms of MongoDB, Kubernetes, but we can also see um, how we can improve things uh, from the application point of view. Uh, and we have our latest release uh, 3.6 that should be out kind of soon, uh, before Christmas, I think. Uh, and we have some um, cool features that are coming um, more on the, on the driver side uh, that, for example, can be useful when dealing with the uh, microservices and, and this type of infrastructure in, or uh, architectures. So these two features are uh, retriable writes. Uh, so this means that we have an operation ID uh, and for example let's say that you know we send um, we send the operation there is a temporary network problem and the operation didn't work so the driver will retry the operation automatically uh, for once um, and will try to repeat the operation and if that fails of course nothing will happen but at least it will try to um, do a second attempt on the on the operation and then we also have a uh, chain streams um, the idea here is that uh, something that there have been like a lot of requests to have probably sooner than, than, than this. Uh, but the idea is that this is a change notification API. Um, so we can have, uh, let's say that we have this collection in our database uh, and we have another application that wants just to listen to any change in that uh, in that collection without having to be querying and build your, our own logic in the application the idea with this is that we can just define um, a cursor using this aggregation and this cursor will receive automatically all the all the updates all the changes um, happening on the on the collection whether it's insert updates we will be able to to get these changes um, you know automatically instead of doing things like tailing the, the uplog or building our own logic. So just to, to summarize, uh, we have seen uh, quite interesting things in terms of 
high availability for, for our uh, microservice application with, the, with MongoDB. So with MongoDB, we have okay, the replica set, we have a copy of our, our data, we have uh, automatic failover when the primary crashes, there is an election, and the, one of the secondaries will become primary. Uh, we can scale uh, if, are, if you want to uh, further by uh, using the secondaries for read operations. In terms of Kubernetes and using stateful sets, um, we, we can see that um, Kubernetes will uh, add additional features to, to our configuration. Uh, and this is just by, by default Kubernetes. So for example, when we kill a pod or we have a pod is deleted, uh, the pod will be restarted automatically. Uh, if one of our nodes in the cluster goes down or there is a, an issue or something, um, th all the pods in that node will be rescheduled to a different node available in the cluster. And then we have persistent volume so that we can persist our data and this will also um, be uh, maintained, the persistency will be maintained even when if the pod is rescheduled to a different node. But also now in terms of uh, the applications and the drivers, we had before in the previous releases um, you know, that one of the main goals for the drivers was to make them uh, really easy to use and something that it's quite simple for developers to, to interact with MongoDB. And we have also things like a server selection algorithm or the read preference. So for those of you that haven't heard of read preference means that we can, in a replica set, we can select if we want to read for the primary, from try to read first from the secondaries or even based on the latency. So we can do read preference nearest. Uh, so if our application is in a data center where we have a secondary and not the primary, we can try to use the secondary first for read operations. Uh, and now in 3.6, uh, we are adding some more uh, cool features. So we have a retriable write, we are adding sessions, um, we also added a wire protocol compression. So that means that the tra network traffic uh, will be uh, reduced. And we also added the cha chain streams. Um, so yeah, this is all um, different um, different elements in terms of high availability and how this can help us when we are building our microservice application with uh, with MongoDB. So now we cover different parts of, of our use case here, uh, the, the infrastructure with the Kubernetes, MongoDB, the application. Now, how we can connect our application? Well, let's say that our application is running in Kubernetes. It's just quite easy, just the MongoDB URI. As I said before, Kubernetes has an internal DNS server. So it means that we can just point to the different uh, pods, the different uh, MongoDB nodes, just by using the, the well-known host name. So we know that it's Mongo0, Mongo1, and Mongo2. It's important that we do it this way when you, we are using a replica set. Uh, to make sure that we are pointing to all the nodes in the replica set uh, and not just to, let's say, the primary. Uh, and we'll see uh, now in a, in a bit why. Uh, so in terms of um, resiliency of our, of our application, there are different things that we should test. In terms of the infrastructure, we should test things like a failover. So if we change the, the primary of the replica set, uh, if a pod gets killed, you know, maybe you know, an angry developer can go and just go and kill the pod. I don't know. Um, if the pod is rescheduled, so the node is down and the, the pod gets scheduled into a different node. So this is uh, all uh, cases that we need to, to understand if we are building a microservice application um, with, with MongoDB. And also the same in, in terms of the application resiliency. How the application reacts to uh, the server's discovery and selection, uh, how the application reacts to, let's say, that there is an election in the replica set, a change in the primary, how the application will reconnect after that event, how it reacts to things like timeouts or even transient errors, and, you know, will our write succeed or not in that case. Uh, so if you are interested in this, uh, there is uh, this link uh, points to the, um, the blog from my colleague uh, Jesse. Uh, and um, there are like quite useful uh, recommendations there uh, to build applications running on MongoDB and make sure that they will be high available uh, and, and resilient to this type of, of events. So now let's do a, a demo um, of more 
of the actual use case that, that we discussed here with the stateful set. Uh, we'll see a different application and uh, we'll cover probably only the main two scenarios as the other one it will take a bit more time to delete the instance and, and see what happens. But let's get started with this one. Um, again, like I'll share the slides, you have the URL there if you want to play and, and test with this um, on your own. So now I have, um, again, just for simplicity, I have everything uh, deployed here. Um, so uh, the elements that are relevant here is uh, I have a second uh, demo application. You can see here that I have Mongo 0, 1, and 2. So this is the actual uh, stateful set. Uh, Mongo Watch is, is just a Kubernetes job that runs a shell script, uh, kind of quick and dirty that I built to define the replica set configuration. And it uses the property of a stateful set of, um, of the predictable host name. So basically, it's quite simple. What it does is to uh, check, uh, wait until um, it runs inside the Kubernetes cluster. So it waits until it can ping Mongo 0, Mongo 1, and Mongo 2. Once it pings the, the three of them, uh, it will connect to Mongo 0, and it will just automatically do the replica set configuration. So thanks to the predictable host names, we can do things like that. Um, and then we also have change streams here. Uh, and what I did here is just to show the, the logs um, for the, the application. So we should be seeing the, the changes here. Um, and just to show you what um, uh, how the, the stateful set looked like. Uh, we can see there that we have the desire number three, we have currently three. We can describe the configuration. Uh, you can see this in more detail if you are interested. The YAML files are in the GitHub repo. Uh, but we can see things here like the, the labels that I'm using. Um, I also defined um, init containers here. Um, I'm using uh, the release candidate 2 for RC, uh, for 3.6.0. Um, I'm defining the MongoD command here. I'm also using uh, both a liveness probe and a readiness probe. Uh, so in Kubernetes, we can use this um, to detect not only that the pod is up and running, but also that uh, the actual service, the actual service from the process is, is actually responding uh, and, and available. So let's go to, to our application. Um, now we had, a, we had enough with the, with the food earlier on. So now uh, it's more about beers, right? We had some pizza, so <laughs> let's go with, with a few beers. Uh, and actually, let me move this. So hopefully we will see some of the changes there. OK, so suggestion for this. <laughs> Sorry? Oh, OK. <laughs> Peroni. Again, this is like a um, similar situation as the previous demo. Um, the application is writing to, to our database. In this case, we are writing to our uh, replica set packed by primary and two secondaries. Um, so the, the data there is written in the, in the database. Um, what else? OK. Man. Something else. Um, sometimes it's fine to have a corona as well, you know. That's not <laughs> of course. Oh. Yes. Is someone noticing something strange in the screen? Oh. <laughs> okay, that could be another discussion. <laughs> um. So for example, let's say that someone doesn't like Guinness. Let's remove it. Sorry? At first we had top 10. Yes. And now we have top 40. OK. That's it. Only that? I don't know. 
Okay, so be be careful at the screen now. Uh, I'm come on one beer. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> oh. Hey, again. Okay, I'm going to insert this, but look at the screen and, and see what happens. And it's not that you need to necessarily look at the application, right? Did you notice anything? OK. <laughs> so this is what it was what was changing. So this was uh, the um, this is just like a simple Python script that it's using change streams. So it was actually uh, sending the output of every change that we were doing to the application. So if I delete uh, Heineken now, you can see that there was a change here. I'm going to add now, um, let's say, another Italian beer. See? So this is just uh, a Python script that it's uh, doing change streams on the, on the collection. And we can see how we are getting like the full document uh, with, the, with the actual text here. And uh, we are getting the underscore ID. And, and some other properties, and we can see that this was an insert. So this is quite cool, you know, for if we let's say that we have another microservice application that we want to monitor uh, changes into our main collection. But now we also want to test um, um, the high availability of our application, right? So that was the, the whole goal of the of the configuration. So let me. So what I'm doing here is just um, running another, um, just uh, up another container on the cluster, uh, and just connecting to to Mongo Zero. It might take some time, but it should. Okay, so it's connected now. So I just did the Mongo uh, on host Mongo zero. So you can see that because I'm already in the Kubernetes cluster, I can use just that host name. Um, so if I do RS status, just to check the, the replica set configuration, I can see that I have a secondary here. It's Mongo two. Um, Mongo one is secondary, and Mongo zero is primary. So the first step to, to test is uh, how the application will react to um, to a step down, basically changing the, um, the primary. So because I'm connecting in the primary and running a step down, and now uh, Mongo zero, it's a, it's a secondary. So let's see how the application reacts. Again, the pod is still running, but it's just that there was a, an election there. OK, so the application just you know refresh. When there was the, the step down, there was an election. Uh, so a new primary was selected, but then the application, as soon as detected the, the changes, connected, and we have our our beers here. Luckily, <laughs> uh, so now the next step is to see um, who the the primary is. So Mongo two is secondary. Okay, Mongo one is primary, and Mongo zero is secondary. So now let's do something uh, different, and let's just kill. Um, Let's delete uh, Mongo one. So Mongo one is where we are running the primary. Um, so we just delete it. Um, and again, what will happen here is that Kubernetes will restart the process. But if I restart the application, it's uh, taking some some time. So in the meantime, in at the MongoDB level, there is an election. Uh, so a new primary will be elected. Uh, this usually can take like a few seconds. OK, here our application is back. So in this case, our application, because we were defining the three uh, MongoD nodes, is um, it's actually uh, resilient to this type of changes, to uh, an election, uh, to a step down, or, or to just deleting the, the pod. Um, and uh, 
we are we are still having the data here <laughs> so because we are using persistent volumes and because we are using a replica set the data is still is still available um, and you know you can add um, you know, any suggestion for the last beer the night okay that's a good one mm. how do you <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. Thanks. So we can write that to the application, and you know our application is it's still available. If let's say that uh, we, mm, if there will be like another election, and we will be back to Mongo zero or to Mongo one, uh, the data will be still there uh, because we are using persistent volumes. So this means that you know our application is resilient to things like elections, but also to uh, with persistent volumes we'll have the data. Uh, actually persistent for, for our application. And the next step will be to just uh, go and delete the, the node at the Google Cloud level, but that takes like a couple of minutes. Um, so if you are interested, you can test that. Uh, but basically what will happen is that um, th the, the node will be scheduled to a different uh, node. So we need to make sure that we have another node available. Uh, also considering the affinity rule. So because we have the affinity rule uh, of deploying only one pod. If we have only three nodes, we won't be able to schedule the pod uh, there. So with this, um, that's pretty much it for the for the presentation. Just in terms of a summary, um, we have seen like the key elements to have a, a successful microservice application running on MongoDB. Uh, we have seen things like uh, how to do successfully scheduling, the importance of affinity, how we can define resource limits and, and requests, uh, the unique network identifiers, how we can save and, and persist the state of the application, how we can isolate the processes, uh, how it's important to define uh, high availability. Uh, and at the end, you know, if we are building a, our application, we want to make sure that our, the application is resilient, that we are not, uh, we not, we don't get called. Uh, because the application is down, things like that. So this is really, really important. Uh, and then we can do further improvement with Liveness Pro. We could use uh, disruption budget or, or uh, quality of services classes. Uh, these are all from, from Kubernetes to improve further uh, our configuration here. Uh, so that's it. Uh, thank you. If you have any questions, uh, I'll be around for a while. And um, that's my Twitter handle. And you have all the, the information here. I'll share the, the slides anyway. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark.